السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته. Uh, just a correction. I did not get my PhD from Imam University. I got my bachelor and my master degree in the Imam University in Saudi Arabia. Uh, but to my uh, doctor, I got it, my PhD, I had it from Graduate Theological Foundation in Indiana. Um, just for the record as a correction. Jazakallah uh, khair Danish and uh, thank you for having me in, uh, in this platform. Actually, it should be our platform since I'm the Vice President of Al Maghrib. And I would like to say uh, thank you all for coming and uh, sharing with us this wonderful two days, which is inshallah will be full of beneficial knowledge for all of us. Uh, that's one of the most important goals that we seek in Al Maghrib Institute, that we expose ourselves and our community to the knowledge and to make sure that what motivates us, what, the, uh, what control basically our mind is education. Education is the best way for any community to prevail or to be strong. That's why we care a lot about, or that's actually our main focus as an organization, educational organization, to spread the knowledge and the ilm between our brothers and sisters. It is a picture very hard to forget. It's that image that you might sell it as well in TV. When you see that young man, full of life, energy, and even you can tell from the way he dresses, the way he looks, the way he talks, that he's a religious person, motivated, committed, willing to do anything you can imagine for his religion or for what he thinks is correct and true. Some of them may be wearing that black turban, and next to him, Klashenkov with a, or a machine gun, and some even stripe themselves with bombs and declaring his wasiyah, his will, his last words in this dunya. Then in a few seconds, this image goes away. Then another image comes on the TV screens of somebody who blow himself up and his body is all over the asphalt of the street or in the bus or in that building that he decide to attack. With him, maybe nobody. He's the only one dead on that image. And sometimes other few people's children's women's, elders, people in the streets, happened to be in the subway that day, happened to be in his office in that day, or sometimes even soldiers and government officials. Then you see after that image, the family members and the respond of the media and the community how they react to such incident. It is an image that I cannot put my head on the sand and I claim that I never saw. It is an image that no one can claim that it never exists. Those people who dress that way to imitate some leaders, the sad part that those young men and sometimes women they will die while their leaders watching them. They threw them in this, in the middle of this war to blow, to blow themselves up and to kill themselves and others while they are watching. It is sad when you see the mother and the parents been crying over the death of their sons or been humiliated and sometimes arrested 
and all the friends and the family members and the consequences of these actions. And Allah only knows how far these actions can reach, the consequences of this action can reach. Sometimes you don't see him even dead, that person. You see that person surrounded with a tens of soldiers and FBI agents or other agencies in other places in the world captured him before he did anything. And what happened to him? He just basically ended his life by spending the rest of his life behind bars and so many times will be even executed and killed. You know, whatever happened to family members, the reaction, the backlash that the community will suffer from such action, it's a terrible thing. But really for me, the real issue that this young man died while he or she think that they are doing something good. They lost the only chance that they have in their life when they participated in that war or in that uh, suicide mission. And that's remind me of what Mutarrif ibn Abdullah ibn Shakhir said to a young group of Muslims in his town came to him and offered him the opportunity to participate in a war against unjust ruler, a killer, a murderer, a dictator, his name is Hajjaj ibn Yusuf al thaqafi They rebel against him under the leadership of, of Ibn al Ash'ath. And they came to Mutarrif and said, Join us. This is jihad fi sabirillah. What is better than you sacrifice your soul for the sake of Allah? Inna Allah ashtara min al mu'minina anfusahum wa amwalahum. Allah have purchased the souls and the money of the believers that they give it up for the sake of Allah, so Allah gave them Jannah. What do you want more than that? That's the language that they used. But the reaction of that wise scholar, wise worshiper, was like this. He said, what you are in is a matter of confusion. It's not clear that you are upon the truth. And I don't believe that this is correct what you're doing. And I have only one soul, I have one life, I have only one chance. If I die, I will never be rescinded back to this worldly life to correct what I have done wrong. So I will rather in the day of judgment not to be asked why you killed somebody than to be asked why you have not participated. Those young men who lost their chance by going in a such path will never be justified their actions if their intention is good or they trying to do what is correct. Because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, قُلْ هَلْ نُنَبِّئُكُمْ بِالْأَخْسَرِينَ أَعْمَالًا أَلَّذِينَ ضَلَّ سَعْيُهُمْ فِي الْحَيَاةِ الدُّنْيَا وَهُمْ يَحْسَبُونَ أَنَّهُمْ يُحْسِنُونَ صُنْعًا You want to know about those, the most losing people. Those who will do things in this worldly life and they are losers in the day of judgment. They lose, they don't gain anything out of this action that they have done. Even though they thought they are doing the best. Ibn Mas'ud rahimahullah put it correctly. قَالَ وَكَمْ مِنْ مُرِيدٍ لِلْخَيْرِ لَمْ يَبْلُغُهُ لَمَّا قَالُوا لَهُ مَا أَرَدْنَا إِلَّا الْخَيْرَ يَا أَبَا عَبْدِ الرَّحْمَانِ Ad-Darimi reported that Ibn Mas'ud told a group of people who did something not according to the Sharia. Ah. He told them, they told Ibn Mas'ud, we only intend good. Good intention is not enough. Then Ibn Mas'ud said, so many people intend to do something good, but they have not done. What you really you did is something wrong. My brothers and sisters, Allah is my witness that the only reason I accept to talk about this subject, even though it was not my suggestion, but I never had a hesitation 
to talk about this subject because the love that I have for this young Muslims brothers and sisters who I know that so many of them motivated by the love for the religion and the frustration of the political, the poor political situation that the Muslims the Ummah going through these days. And also for the love for those people who have been deceived by certain groups and certain individuals who knows how to talk maybe more eloquently than me. And they know how to quote a verse from here and a hadith from there to deceive those Muslims who are not really aware and really educate, well educated in this subject. And it end up that those young people or old will end up corrupting their deen and their dunya. Their first life and the second. Because my brothers and sisters, there is nothing worse after shirk, after committing shirk, associating other with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, than killing a person, than killing an innocent person. وَالَّذِينَ لَا يَدْعُونَ مَعَ اللَّهِ إِلَهًا آخَرُ Those who do not call upon other than Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, they don't worship other than Allah. وَلَا يَقْتُلُونَ النَّفْسَ الَّتِي حَرَّمَ اللَّهُ إِلَّا بِالْحَقِّ وَلَا يَزْنُونَ and the second crime, the second major sin was mentioned here is basically killing an assault that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala forbade, uh, forbade to be killed. And the third sin that they commit fabrication. Allah said about those who will do such sins, Their punishment will be doubled in the day of judgment. And they will stay for it in a very long time in this punishment. Except those who repent to Allah and will do good deeds. What is the worst sin, Ya Rasulullah? He said, "And tad'u ma'a Allahi niddan wa qad khalaqak." To pray to other than Allah and Allah is the one who created you. Qila thumma ay, then what? Qala an taqtul waladaka min imlaq. That you will kill your son because of the fear of poverty. Qala thumma ay, qala an tazniya bi halilati jarik. That you will commit adultery to fornicate with your neighbor's wife. Qala al-'ulama this, the Prophet ﷺ mentioned the greatest three sins that can ever be committed and he mentioned the worst case scenario of each case. The worst case scenario when it comes to worshipping other than Allah that you pray to other than God, than Allah and he's the one who created you. This is the worst form of kufr or disbelief and the worst form of killing to kill your own son and the worst case when it comes to fornication, to fornicate with your wives, with the neighbor's wife. So, as also Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, You are at ease unless you will cause to injure, to kill someone. My brothers and sisters, I wish that tonight we will open our hearts and mind for dialogue and education and to open our mind to discuss or to listen at least to point of views that I'm going to raise today regard to some of the issues that I believe it was raised by those extreme groups over the internet used mainly to motivate or to justify the act of terrorism which has been taken against Muslim and non-Muslims as well in North America, in Europe, in the Middle East, in so many countries and over across the globe. And to clarify the truth from the falsehood because 
the nature of any deviant sects or groups that appeared in Islam, that nobody comes and say, you know what, I'm wrong, I disannounce Islam and Sunnah and this is, nobody say that. Everybody has to back his or her, to back their argument with evidence, evidence from Quran or Sunnah. That was the case from the very early time during the history of Islam. But here there is an important point, which is a lot of Western educator raised, and non-Muslims also raised, that sometimes when I talk about this issue, the question will come, and how do you know that you are upon the truth? He, they claim that they are upon the truth, and they said there is no solutions that some of the non-Muslim would say, you shiuch, student of knowledge, comes and talk to the Muslim community, telling them whatever you want to tell, but still in the end of the day, they're going to tell whatever they know, and no final, basically, decision will be made. This is maybe applicable to, as I said, to a lot of people who have Western background or Christian background in general, and, and to be specific. In Islam, it is a little bit different. In Islam, we don't have that loose end in certain areas. Yes, there is a diversity in our religion. There is different opinions are accepted in different fields. But also we have something we call usulun muhkamatun fi sharia principles, foundations, that no argument about it. And that's what we use against those basically, uh, those groups and these extreme groups. In Islam, we have a concept that's called innovations in religion. And those innovations are leading to the hellfire as the Prophet It is not the first time for Muslim to deal with such groups. It's not the first time that we have an extreme group in any areas, in, uh, as a militant groups or even in ideologies to deal with them. And it's been clear for the history of Muslims that they were, alhamdulillah, the mainstreams and to isolate these ideas and they were always minority and they will remain because the shaitan, the satan always has people that he will be able to deceive and to take them astray. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, Inna nahnu nazzalna dhikra wa inna lahu lahafidhun. We have sent down a dhikr, we have sent down the Quran, and we are going to protect it. And the protection of the religion, as Ibn Hazm rahimahullah, wrote a beautiful article about this, and Ibn al-Qayyim also, that the protection of the religion is not only by protecting the text, it's also by protecting the understanding, the correct understanding of the text. That it has to be protected. And how it's been protected as the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, that the Prophet ﷺ told us that there will be a division. Whoever will live among you will see a lot of divisions happen to the Muslims. And this divisions among Muslims will be even where it will be greater than the division happen among Christians and Jews. But the difference that in among religions before us, there is no one, there is no sect, there is no group been promised to be always victorious and clearly recognize as the group upon the truth. But in the case of Muslim, he said, لا تزال طائفة من الأمة على الحق منصورة ظاهرين على من خالفهم. They are will be victorious. They will be always recognized recognized by the methodology that they follow. The common sense that they have, the foundations and the principle that they are holding into it. That's why there is no one ever invented an innovation in religion or established a sect in religion unless you will see him clearly or her contradict themselves or will contradict a clear text in Quran and evidence. And this statement is not just a statement I'm saying in the lecture. This is a statement made by scholars well-founded in religion, well, experts when it comes to the history of sects such as Shaykh al-Islam, Ibn Taymiyyah rahimahullah ta'ala, or Ibn al-Qayyim rahimahullah. 
And if I need to coat, I'm willing to. Just an example of Ibn Taymiyyah rahimahullah said in the Tadmuriya, he said that everything that the innovators tried to establish and to avoid by inventing new principles or ideas in religion, they will end up contradicting themselves by doing what is worst. By doing what is worst. And another time Ibn al-Qayyim rahimahullah said, a very general statement said, وَكُلُّ مَنْ أَصَّلَ أَصْطًا لَمْ يُؤَصِّلْهُ اللَّهُ وَرَسُولُهُ قَادَهُ قَصْرًا إِلَى رَدِّ السُّنَّةِ In the introduction of his great book, Shifa'ul Alil, he said everybody invented in religion a principle that is not in the religion, it will lead him to reject a text from Quran and Sunnah. And the both have given hundreds and tens of examples of the practices of these sects. I'm not here to talk about this, in particular the history of sects in Islam. I do have already a set of CDs, you can see it, it has some examples, not necessarily directly related to this subject, but it is no doubt uh, incorporate with the subject in general. My brothers and sisters, the issue of innovations in religion is an issue been documented, it's clear, we know how to uh, recognize innovations from what is sun innovations in religion from what is sunnah. Those groups that I'm talking about today are not new. There is a similar group, even though my personal opinion, that not so many of these extreme groups that adopt uh, uh, the, the methods of attacking and killing uh, governments and uh, non-Muslims in general, like Al-Qaeda and Tanzim al-Jihad uh, uh, in Egypt and what known today as Al-Jabha al-Alamiyyah li muharabat al-Salibiyyin wal-Yahud, the international coalition of Muslim sects to uh, declaring war against Christians and Jews, which is have Tanzim al-Jihad in Egypt, Al-Qaeda bin Laden, and two groups from Pakistan and Bangladesh have signed that coalition treaty or documentation in, uh, in the 1998, in 1998. Such group, they are not new. Such ideologies and the argument that they came up with also in North Africa and in Egypt, there are so many different groups as well uh, in Europe in, in America, you'll find here and there people who adopt certain ideologies that, as I said, it's not new in its nature. It is something known from long time ago. There is a time came where Muslims politically were in unrest. There's unrest political situations. And also where some Muslims have seen change in the leadership, in the government where they notice or they claim that there is a corruption in the government. And that was in the time of Uthman radiallahu anhu arda. And that led them to change what they thought is a corruption by killing Uthman. When there is a fight between Muslim leaders, Ali radiallahu anhu, Muawiyah and Zubair, three major basically uh, leaders here, and there is a fight happen between them. There is a group of Muslims said, this is not acceptable, this is wrong, they are all against the Sharia, what is the solution? Let's assassinate them. Kill them, and to get rid of the problem. And those people develop later on, they start as something we call it al haruriyah and they end up in a very well-known sect in the history of Islam, it's called Al-Khawarij. And I definitely recommend Muslim to revisit and to study those group. Because the Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said in Sahih Muslim, قَالَ لَا يَزَالُونَ يَخْرُجُونَ فِي عِرَادِكُمْ حَتَّى يَخْرُجَ الدَّجَّالِ They will always come and appear in your society, in your community, until the, the fall Messiah appear. So they will be always exist in the Muslims at word or among Muslims or in the world in general until the end of the days, basically. I believe not necessarily all of these groups are khawarij. Because one of the basic argument, those people will come and tell you, I don't believe if you commit major sin, you are kafir. And the khawarij believe that. Al 
Khawarij believe that Allah cannot be seen in the Day of Judgment. And we don't believe that. Al Khawarij believes that there is no intercession for the sinners in the Day of Judgment. We don't believe in that. We believe in the Salafi Aqeedah of Ahl Sunnah al Jama'ah that there is intercession in the Day of Judgment, that when you commit a major sin, you will not be kafir by drinking alcohol. Would that free them from that label? No. As a matter of fact, if you look at how the early Muslim generation used to consider somebody from Khawarij or not, it's not necessarily by these ideologies. It is by the spirit, the practices. Actually, they said, Man hamala sayfa fahuwa min al This is the only description you will find among the early generations. And I'm talking about the first 300 years in Islam. Those who carry weapons, those who feel that the way to uh, uh, basically, to get their message across, it will be by carrying weapons and fighting and killing innocent people. Sometimes you see people have the spirit of Al Khawarij, not the methodology of Al Khawarij, not the belief of Al Khawarij, the spirit of Al Khawarij. And that can be exist in so many people. For instance, those who rush and go hasty to say, you are hypocrite, you are kafir, you are mubtadi', you are this, you are that. This is the spirit of al-khawarij. Those who always concentrate on criticizing and attacking their brothers and sisters, it is the spirit of al-khawarij. Those who are extreme in their views, even in their worshiping God, it's a spirit of al-khawarij. Aisha radiallahu anha wa ardaha was told about a man whenever he recites the Quran, he will immediately fall unconscious. Oh, I've been and he moved by the verses and fall unconscious. Aisha said, this is from al-khawarij. This man from al-khawarij. Ibn Umar said the same thing as has been recorded by Lalaka'i and Ibn Waddah and others. Why? Because that the spirit, she said, أصحاب محمد كانوا أتقى قلوبا منهم وما كان أحدهم إذا تلي القرآن عليه يغشى عليه. The Prophet وسلم companion they were more righteous than them and none of them did what they doing. So this is an an important point here to differentiate between also the spirit of الخوارج that those groups might have and not necessarily the ideology or the ideological uh, beliefs that الخوارج used to have. Today, I think it is important to talk about the subject because I don't want to be among some of my brothers who unfortunately still insisting that this is not a problem. After all what we hear today in the news and we seen and we personally dealt with, this insisting that this is not a major problem to deal with, they are just some of them so naive or so, I don't know what to call, but they said, oh, this exaggeration is made by the CIA, or the Mossad, or the Muslim governments. They made them. Otherwise, there is no such groups. Subhanallah. I don't know when such people will wake up. Also, some brothers and sisters, or some student of knowledge will not like to talk about the subject because for a simple reason. Because the other side, there are so many injustices happened by the hand of the government of the United States against Muslims world. So many injustices that we don't agree with happening against the Muslims and Palestines by the hand of Israel's. And there are so many injustices happening to Muslims individuals, happening to the Muslims inside the Muslims country by the hand of so many dictators and governments. So they think if you talk about these groups, you will justify what you don't agree with, which is done by any country, Muslim or non-Muslims. And I believe that's not fair, and that's not right. One mistake plus one mistake will never make one correct. It will make two mistakes. You need to say that what is happening in the Muslim's country by the hand of Muslims or by the government of US or any country in the world, if you believe and you think it is wrong, you stand up and you argue that and you make your point. And a lot of people, thousands of people have made their points clear that they agree or disagree with their government if they take a position toward one case or another. 
But this is, will never justify us also to remain silent and to turn our back or our face to the other direction and let these groups grow. And when some student of knowledge did that, and I remember that as if it was yesterday in Saudi Arabia, when I used to talk with some individuals and I told them you should come across and talk clearly about such individuals who these ideas growing, they said, no, no, don't worry, let them, there are so many injustices happening to them, let them put pressure in the government. What happened? The things have got out of hand. Out of hand. And we all of a sudden we hear every other month about people blowing themselves up in a compound or in a government building or assassinating a, 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 an, a government official. Now they regret that they have not talked early about this issue. So I think it is an essential, it is important for us to be brave and to admit that we do have a problem. But the good news is, the good news is that the nature of the Muslim community to fight terrorism, the nature of the Muslim community is to reject extremism. That's the nature of our community. Somebody was telling me once, it is the Muslim community responsibility to fight terrorism. I said I have a better way to put it. The Muslim community naturally reject extremism. Actually, it's a trend. For those who have gone extreme, or those extreme people, you know which community they belong to? The community of forums. The community of internet. But they never been active in their community. You will never ha see them actively work in social works. You will never see them organizing a blood drive. You will never see them carrying canned foods to the homeless. You will never see them work in a masajid or a Muslim community. Because this environment is so healthy. This environment is busy with what is beneficial. And it's very hard for a such person to fit in. That's why you always go and find them only online. Or wherever they will be hiding. And this not only in the West, by the way, even in the Middle East, even in the Muslim country, you will see them always away from the community. Reclaiming Islam from the jihadist. I have to declare this and to say it very clear. That's not the title I have chosen. Actually, it was given to me. And I'm not 100%, and I said that when the title was given to me. But even, I'm the vice president, but we have kind of democracy in the institute. It doesn't mean I have to enforce my uh, belief uh, on them, but, or what I think. But I said I will make that comment. I believe that this name, not an accurate name, and I would never use it if it's only my choice. Because that's pro provoke others. And indeed it did. <laughs> so, and maybe make people angry. And the last thing I want to do is to make anybody angry. That's not my goal. My goal is to guide you. My goal is to stretch my hand, not to hit with my hand, to welcome you. I don't want anyone when you hear this lecture because of the title will take a defense position. You know what? I'm holding it and now you're taking it from me. No, no, no. That's, that's not what I want. I want you to open your mind and your eyes and to listen to the evidence, to listen to the elders among the scholars, to look around and to see the picture clear, not only the way that it's been put in front of you. I also believe that this title have done injustice to the word jihad. Because I believe those people that I'm talking about, they don't deserve the word jihadist. Because the word jihad is a beautiful word, is an Islamic word. With the whole word used to know the word jihad in a very beautiful way. When the 80s, you hear about the mujahideen, the mujahideen, the mujahideen in Afghanistan. But those people who have taken this word or say we are jihad, jihad is far away from what they're doing. What they're doing is baghi, transgressions, is dhulm, injustice, abusing, murderous. Qatala. They're not, this is not what the jihad that Allah and His Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam have came uh, with. So, in 
the old days, the Khawarij used to call themselves as Shurat, those who sold their souls to Allah. They sold their souls to Allah. Did any one of the Muslim scholars agree on this name? No. They never called them this because they don't deserve it. Because they were liars. They called them by the name that they, 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 they deserve. al khashabiya al azariqa al ibadiya these names, Khawarij, Haruriya. You never find one of these names have a good or meaning. Two, I don't think that they I need to reclaim. Alhamdulillah, they are minority. They never took or hijacked Islam. But no doubt in media, they were a perfect example to be used to some media, not all of them. I have to be also very clear. Some of media, out of ignorance and sometimes not, they might think or generalize in their terms uh, uh, against uh, uh, Islam and Muslim by linking Islam to such ideologies, such ideologies. Um, a lot of people have been deceived by such people for two reasons. One, because their appearance. Because they look religious. They have big beard. They quote Quran. They memorize the Quran. And I just want to remind everyone here with what Imam al-Bukhari and Muslim reported in the Sahih. That the Prophet ﷺ said, from Hadith Ali ibn Abi Talib wa Abi Sa'id al-Khudri, group of the Sahabas, narrated the Hadith. The Prophet ﷺ said, there is a group will come. When you compare your prayer to their prayer, the way you pray to the way they pray, and he talking about who? About the companions of Muhammad. You compare the companions of Muhammad's prayer and fasting and the way they read Quran to the way those group read Quran and fast and pray, your prayer will seem to be like nothing comparing to them. So that means so righteous. So you pray a lot. تَحْقِرُونَ صَلَاتَكُمْ إِلَى صَلَاتِهِمْ وَصِيَامَكُمْ إِلَى صِيَامِهِمْ يَقْرَؤُونَ الْقُرْآنَ They read the Quran. لا يجاوز حناجرهم But reading Quran will not travel farther than their throats. It means they don't understand it. It doesn't go to the brain. They don't understand, they just read it. They're just quoting it. Or it will not travel to the sky where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala accept the deeds. It will not. He said, لَإِنْ أَدْرَكْتْ يَخْرُجُونَ مِنَ الْإِسْلَامِ لَا يَعُودُونَ إِلَيْهِ They leave and exit Islam and they will never come back to it. And because of this, I believe also that some of those extreme people who have gone so far I have so much big doubt that they will ever come back. And I don't care much about talking to them. Because I think they've gone, the Prophet said they exit, they never come back. You read tens of companions and successors and early scholars said, Sahibu bid'ah la yatub, a novator will never repent. And they always connect this to the Khawarij. You see, maybe Shi'i, Rabidi, Qadari, whatever, he repent. But the Khawarij, usually they don't. They stay this way. And that's one of the dangerous things. If you take that route and you go deep in it, it might be so dark that you never you get lost. You cannot never come back. If I ever meet them, I will kill them all. I will destroy them all. In the same manner as Allah destroyed the people of Ad and Thamud. Whoever killed them, he will be rewarded. Or fight them, he will be rewarded. Anyway, as I said, I'm not saying that they are the Khawarij, they are the Haruriyah, but they have the spirit of such people. So don't let the look deceive you. Don't let the turban and the big beard and that deceive you. No. It is what they calling, what they base their argument on. Two, what led a lot of people to be deceived by them also that they caught a lot of scholars. A lot of well-known, recognized scholars. Like Ibn Taymiyyah, Rahimahullah, Muhammadul Wahhab, and uh, 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 Dhahabi, Ibn Kathir. They use this a lot to appear as if they are people who base their argument in fundamentals and foundations and so on. And we will give an example, inshallah, of how this is not accurate or uh, uh, fully true. I would like to make 
a, a, a point here or a declaration. I give before several lecture, two lectures close to this subject. And I have used a word on it, and it raised a lot of attention at that time, and a lot of people talked to me about it. And I would like to say that I said at these lectures something in that line, that the people who have gone to participate in the war in Afghanistan in the 80s or the Mujahideen, that I remember, or I know a lot of people in that time when I was a young man in, 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 uh, in Arabia, and I see a lot of people going there, they were people who couldn't make any difference in their life. They were not successful of family in their society, and they end up going that. I believe that generalizing this word is not accurate, is not correct, and I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to forgive me from it. And I think that's not the correct point to make that general statement. Because among the people who went to the jihad in Afghanistan in the 80s, sincere men and women, and they were uh, not losers, they were successful people who went in that time to fight the Russian. Uh, and hasha lillah that I meant to generalize. There's a lot of Afghani sincere brothers and sisters sacrifice their lives and their family died in the process of liberation of Afghanistan from the Russian. And I think it will not be fair to make a general uh, statement. But I was talking about a group of people, a certain group of people who later on formulate these extreme views and ideas. So just to make sure that this is uh, clear, uh, so basically, we're talking about the people who uh, we talk about the people who spread extreme views in a such manner to encourage people to kill or injure or destroy urbans uh, or kill innocent people, Muslims or non-Muslims, attacking and transgressing transgress, to transgress against. Uh, Muslim or non-Muslims as well. In a Muslim country or a non-Muslim country, uh, as long as there is no a status of a clear war, and I will talk about this because this is an area where they play the game. Oh, there is a war, we have a war, okay, so that's justify what we doing. No, but I'm talking specifically about this group that I mentioned earlier, like Al-Qaeda and people who are circling around their ideologies, circling around their ideologies. And also I would like to praise the brave decisions of certain leaders of these groups who have left these ideologies like Jama'a al Islamiyah in Egypt, al Jama'a al Muqatilah in Libya, in Saudi Arabia so to certain individuals, have declared that they have left and repented from such ideologies. And even posted in the internet very beneficial uh, books written in Arabic and I hope that it was also provided in English for English speakers as well, as well. So this is something, give us hope, inshallah. And it is an, an indication for those young brothers and sisters who basically impressed by these groups to see the other side of the coin and to see from inside what it exactly it, it used to look like. Like when you talk about the history of Ayman al Zawahiri and people like that, you will see totally different picture of what maybe uh, have engraved in your mind about such individuals. Uh, I would like to say that terrorism and extremism always based on two pillars. One, those who supported terrorism uh, by ideologies, by justifying the actions and those who supported it by weapons, by carrying the weapons. And if there is a person who have both, this is the most dangerous person will be. But there is two groups, people they never carry weapons, but they give the idea, they spread the idea. And I think for the Muslim community, for the student of knowledge, the role it should be always, or this is the nature of our community, alhamdulillah, to reject and to fight these ideologies. And we should not wait for the government, and I'm talking specifically about America here, we should not wait for the government to invite the government to fight the ideologies. Because the moment the government step in to fight ideologies, the moment you might be lose a lot of your civil rights. That should be the community role, and that's the 
role that we're expecting from it. That you let the government watch from a distance, but we as a community take care of these ideologies, talk about it, open the dialogue, make to ensure that it is will be clearly addressed and basically uh, opposed by the community. But when it comes, and basically we will be the front row here in fighting terrorism, and any agencies or uh, government agencies should be just from the back, you should not be involved, only the involved if the law was broken. If the law was broken. Because before law, breaking the law, there is a big gap and a distance. And as much as you let the government involved before the law was broken, as much as you're losing left and right from your rights, as the civil rights. But whenever the situation turned to be an act of roles by causing harm or a real threat to the security of the citizen of any country, in this case, our role will be to pull back. And that's the government basically role to ensure that such damage will not take place, such terrorist act will never be uh, taking place to protect the, uh, uh, the citizen of its own country. Usually, my brothers and sisters, terrorist group justify, they take their support from the reaction of government. SubhanAllah. You know, a lot of time you don't hear what caused the problem. Every time they talk about how the governments reacted to them. So they talk a lot about how the Muslims were tortured in the jails. Like what have triggered the whole thing? It will be lost in the dialogue. So as much as there is aggressive reaction from government, as much as these people justify for themselves and feel a lot of people supporting them and sympathy from people. And that should not be a, 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 a way to fool us to forget about what caused the problem from the beginning, from that beginning. So many times terrorist group or extreme group, they start their ideologies, based their ideology in a fair case but not in a fair and just way of treating it. Palestines, it's a fair case, but the way that it might be used and the justification that happened because of it will not be necessarily fair. A portion is something not very good, but to go and blow up a clinic of a, a portion clinic, that's not a right or a fair way of dealing with it. Um, using usuries and, and basically corrupting people's uh, financially and selling drugs and alcohol, it's a bad thing. But to go to blow up certain institutes and killing people there, that's definitely is haram, is haram. So uh, they might have a just case, but they don't have a just means basically to the case that they want to uh, discuss. So we should also keep that in mind when we talk about those group. Okay. Uh, one of the things that I have noticed by studying or reading about the ideologies of these extreme groups, there is very fast trend of changes. And this split very quickly. So it starts with one case, all of a sudden, you start as a big sinners, then you end the biggest hypocrites, then the biggest kafir, then the most enemy of Islam, then you see how it starts, America is bad, then it is the worst, then it is enemy number one, and it is, and now it's one case, two, three, four, five. It's very fast, the chain. So many issues will be raised, and that creates a, a sense of confusion and make it very hard to have a debate or a dialogue, a dialogue. And also shows you how far can it goes. It goes with fighting the people who, the bad, then the people who live with them, then the people who aid them, then the people who live around them. Did you see how does that work? So in the beginning, they said the suicide bombing, it can be done in a case of a uh, fight in the war. Then after that, it became go to a place where there is government. And then you go to a public place. Then end up even killing himself. And they said, that's fine because he raised awareness. See how the change from one level to another, from one level to another. Also, uh, it's, 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 uh, it's interesting. Once it is war against the governments of certain country. In the beginning, for example, Tanzim al-Jihad in Egypt has this 
declaration that they only focus on fighting Egyptian government. They call it al adu al qarib awla min al adu al ba'id, the enemy who's next door, or it's priority for us to fight him than the one who far away. So they never fought any Western country, anything like that. And after years, after more than 1,400 people killed in this process, by the fatwa and by the uh, basically the instruction that given by Zawahiri and people like him, they come later on to say we were wrong. We should not do that. We should not focus on this. After killing more than 1,400 people, 1,300 of them are among the Muslims, among the Egyptian citizens, over a course of less than seven years. Then you change, and now you said, which is very weird, the enemy are the whole world. There is an open war against Christians and Jews everywhere in the world, in America, in Europe, in South America, and everywhere. It is a dramatic change, very fast and unexpected. Also, there are so many contradictions in their approach. For instance, those extreme groups, they calling for the justice of Islam and the implementation of the Sharia and the protecting of human rights. And they are the first one to, to validate all this, to basically not paying attention to human rights, to not applying justice, and not to applying the Sharia as rules. These extreme groups, they ask people to make inkar al-munkar, to basically fight what is evil, and themselves doing what is evil. When you read the fatwa of some of their leaders, when he said it is permissible to go to burn a video stores or alcoholic place or sell alcohol, and even if this is will cause to burn the whole building, then in Egypt, a building will accommodate hundreds of family. They will end up in the street. That's fine. That's not evil. That's not wrong. To go to Mawlid where Sufis gather and to throw a nabal or a bomb in the middle of the gathering, that's okay because that's in Karl Munkar. If somebody die or burn, that's fine. To go to a Shia mosque and to blow it up with the kids and children and everybody, that's fine. That's in Karl Munkar. It is contradiction when somebody just fresh Muslim, fresh young man or woman, come back to Islam, want to practice Islam. The first thing you do, you wrap him up with a, a, a bomb and you go blow yourself up. But isn't that person need to take his time in worshiping Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? Where is the tarbiyah? Where is the i'dad? Did the Prophet used to do that? Contradiction when you hear them in England and living off the social system in Europe and the United States, they taking their pension, their checks from the government that they declare war against it. Isn't that contradiction? Contradiction when your own country want to kill you. When there is a civil war in your country and not a single Muslim country open their doors to take the refugee of these countries who had a civil wars. Where they end up in America and in Europe. Who opened their doors? These countries. And in the return, you plot against them. That's a contradictions. Contradictions when you ask people to blindly follow and obey the Amir and not to obey their parents. It is contradiction when you claim that you follow the scholars, like always quoting. Sheikh Muhammad Abdul Wahab, Shankiti, Bin Baz, talk about. But whenever it comes, their statements against them, they disannounce them immediately. They talk about Muhammad Abdul Wahab and quote him, or Muhammad Ibrahim and quote him, but they never they forget that he was one of the pillars of the Saudi government, that they believe it is the most evil government. Why, why, the, why you pick his opinion in Al-Hukum Bighirman Zalallah and now you forget about his practices? My brothers and sisters, 
Al-Jihad, there is no need for me to talk about the virtues of Jihad. Because this is well established, I don't need me or anybody else. It is one of the pillars and one of the fundamentals on Sharia. And no need for uh, exaggeration or somebody say, oh, talk about the importance of it. We know about it. But let me explain some important fact about Al-Jihad. Al-Islam came to establish a society, a, a civil society. In this society, you will have something called a justice department, like what we have, just to make it simple to be understood. We have a system for how the state work, how the Muslim state work. You have a system how the judge have to practice his uh, war or job, how the policeman has to work it. We call it in Islam, Nidam al husba How there is a financial institute can be built in the country and how they work which a diwan or baytul mal. We have a defense ministry known almost in the history as a diwan, which is people register for the army and so on. And in order for you to organize the concept of war and peace, it was given to the, to the Muslims in a form what we call a tashri'atul jihad, the books of fiqh, Talk a lot about the fiqh, the ruling related to jihad. That's basically when there is a Muslim uh, state or there is a Muslim in a, in a country, how they declare war, when they declare war, what's the ruling related to the war, that's what you read in the books of al-jihad. It's not ever meant for just every individual to claim. It's not like Salat, you can go and make Salat in your own. So you can go and make Jihad in your own. Exactly, you cannot go and say, I'm the judge, I'm gonna apply the punishment, and now I will judge between people. You can't do that, it's not up to you. It is, it is part of a whole system, of part of a whole system. Otherwise, it will be a mess like what we're seeing today. Two, Al-Jihad is a tool, is not a mean. That's why if, as so many scholars like Izz ibn Abd salam and others said, if what you want to establish by jihad can be established without fight, you're not allowed to fight. So it is not a goal. That's why one of the worst things I ever heard in my life, somebody said, so and so is kafir. Why? Because he never, he never declared jihad. SubhanAllah. As if it has to be exist. It's a mean, if there is need for it, you use it. And also al-jihad, is only allowed to be exist if the benefit from it outcome the disadvantages. It's not in all cases, because the Sharia based on istiqlal al-maslaha, when there is the great benefit can be achieved, can be achieved. I don't know if I have time to quote, like Imam al-Kasani, Imam al-Juwayni, so, so many scholars I have their quotes here. They all said, Ibn Qudama rahimahullah, he said, uh, and let me quote Ibn Qudama rahimahullah, إِذَا حَصَرَ الْإِمَامُ حِسْنًا If the Imam of the Muslim, so it's only related to, always related to the Imam, the leaders. If he surrounding a castle, and he found that there is more harm of surrounding them and fighting them, and it is better for the Muslim army to leave them, he should leave. He should leave because the Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam when he surrounded at Ta'if and he every day they were harmed, more people killing and there is hard, it's very hard to enter such castle. He left at Sallallahu and he never came back to attack at Ta'if in al Mughni uh, 10. So there is so many quotes from the scholar, and this is something agreed upon that when there is a great benefit of jihad to be declared, that ruler miss, must make that call in this case. But if the ruler think that it is, will be more disadvantage of declaring war against anybody, he should not involve the community or his country in such, in a such war. Also, the other thing that this issue of jihad, and I believe if you make this point clear, to yourself and to others. That as I said, it's a part of the society. It means it's in the hand of the governor. It's a hand of the leader. It's not in the hand of individuals hiding in caves or in uh, living in, in internet uh, societies or in some apartments here or there. It is in the hand of the Muslim Khalif or Imam who in control of his country. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, وَإِذَا جَاءَهُمْ أَمْرٌ مِّنَ الْأَمْنِ أَوْ الْخَوْفِ أَذَاعُوا بِهِ وَلَوْ رَدُّوهُ إِلَى الرَّسُولِ وَإِلَىٰ أُولِي الْأَمْرِ مِنْهُمْ If there is a matter of fear or safety or peace come a major issue, they have to refer it to the Prophet and to the leaders. 
to the governors, to the presidents, whatever you call them, the leader, Surah An-Nisa 83. No doubt that one of the most important things to be referred to will be the issue of declaring war or peace. The Prophet ﷺ was asked, Ya ayyuha nabiyu harrid al-mu'minina ala al-qital in Surah Al-Anfal verse 65. Oh Muhammad, encourage people to fight. Invite them to fight. So Muhammad, not everybody, and whoever replace Muhammad Sallallahu role, which is the governors and the leaders of the Muslims. Also the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said about the time when there is Muslim will be so much confusion, divisions and disobedience and so forth. In Hadith Hadith, he said, Qala, he said, you gather around the Imam in a time where there are so many groups and sects. He said, you hold with your brothers around the Imam. If there is no Imam, did he said, go and fight them? No. He said, you avoid all of them. So the issue is connected to the existence of the Imam. Also, in Nabiya sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam said, وَإِذَا اسْتُنْفِرْتُمْ فَانْفِرُوا That if you've been called to jihad, you accept. Who make the call? Is the Imam of the Muslimin, as in Nawawi wa bin Hajar rahimahullah, comment into it, and uh, comment on this. Also, the Prophet sallallahu said, مَنْ قَاتَلَ تَحْتَ رَايَةٍ عِمِّيَّةٍ يَدْعُوا إِلَىٰ عَصَبِيَّةٍ أَوْ يَغْضَبُوا لِعَصَبِيَّةٍ فَقُتِلْ فَقِتْلَةٌ جَاهِلِيَّةٍ Those who fight under unknown banners. You didn't know who's the leader. You know what the goal. You didn't know what's going to be establishing. And that will only happen if there is no a political entity leading the war. That's why the war never was, jihad was never established in Mecca. Because there is not yet a political entity. It will be a mess if there is a jihad will establish without a political entity to protect it. Al jihad is basically like a giant uh, 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 force, it has to be controlled by the government to direct it in the govern in the right way. Otherwise, it will cause a lot of damage. Al Imam al Bukhari rahimahullah said in his Sahih, Qal, Babun yuqatalu min wara il Imam. Fight should be behind the leaders, behind the Imam, which is the elected leader or the uh, leader of the Muslims. Mu the Muslims. Uh, there are so many quotes from the Sahaba, from the Tabi'een, from the Ahl Sunnah. It is one of the principles. Read, pick any books in Aqidah, any books of Aqidah of Ahl Sunnah. You will read in it, وَنُقَاتِلُ تَحْتَ أَئِمَّةِ الْجَوْرِ وَالْفُجُورِ وَالْبِرِّ وَالْفُجُورِ قال, uh, مثلا, وَالْغَزْوُ مَا ضِمَّعِ الْأُمَرَاء بَرَرَةً وَفَجَرَةً and so many quotes like this, Barrihim wa Fajirim, fighting and jihad under the Imam. It must be an Imam, and this Imam cannot be just somebody claim that I'm Imam. No, the Imam is somebody who's been gone through a process where the Muslim community have chosen him to be the Imam. I'm saying that because I have seen people trying to, to escape this point and to allow themselves to declare war against others without the Imam. The only exception the ulama made is when somebody attack you in your home. You don't need anybody's permission to fight. To protect yourself, that will be permissible. Uh, I don't have enough time to basically go over uh, the rest of the point that I have, but there is one uh, thing uh, or a few points very quickly I will mention it. Uh, and related to their methodology also in fiqh. I noticed that no, they don't combine by evidence. So they pick one verse or one hadith, but they do combine all evidence together, which is make the picture clear. So if you see one verse talking about, for instance, fight the kuffar wherever they are, you will find another verses. Would would state clearly fight those who are fighting you. Or you will see the practices of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Did the Prophet sallam killed anybody just because he's kafir? And that's one of the things that they claim that if somebody is non-Muslims, that's enough reason for him to be killed. Which is, is that how the Prophet ﷺ treated them? Did the Prophet ﷺ, when he conquered Mecca, killed everybody? Did the Prophet ﷺ declare war against the kuffar in Yemen and, and Jazirat al-Arab, the tribes? Not all of them. He fought as Ibn al-Qayyim rahimahullah. Qala lam yabda Rasulullah ahadan biharbin qat. He never start a war with anybody. 
Is that means only jihad is a defensive? No, jihad is a, to defend the Muslims and also sometimes you initiate it if you know that this is a threat can harm the Muslims in future. And based on this, you will see the actions that took place by a, a, the war that happened with the Romans and others during the time of the Prophet and Abu Bakr and Abu Bakr radiallahu an. Also, uh, there is no a time or they don't look at how also the Sahaba they understand the text. One of the famous texts that they always use, take the kuffar out of Jazirat al-Arab. So that justified them to kill the Americans in Arabia or whatever they are. And I explained that in my lectures in, in a detailed way, so I don't think I need, which is terrorist uh, violence in the name of Allah. I don't think I need to say that again, but uh, just to let you know that the kuffar always been existing in Jazirat al-Arab during the Prophet ﷺ and after the Prophet ﷺ time in the Khulafa and they were always just but the hadith is talking about they don't or uh, that they don't dominate they don't have a domination of their religion over the Arab uh, Peninsula and there is a big debate between the scholars to define what is actually Arab Peninsula some restricted this to Mecca and Medina also uh, you you see one of the issues that they always raise is the issue of al-wala' wal bara And maybe that's the last point I will talk about. Any form of wala' to the kuffar, it means you are not Muslims. And that's also another misunderstanding. Al-wala' in Arabic language, it means love and support. And the love and support, to make it very easy, very simple to you. If you love somebody and you support their ideologies and their belief and their religion, you became one of them. يا أيها الذين آمنوا لا تتخذوا اليهود والنصارى أولياء بعضهم أولياء بعض ومن يتولهم منكم فإنه منهم Or who you believe Don't take Jewish and Christians أولياء And it's a wrong translation to say friends أولياء أولياء The word أولياء means the person that you love and you support They love and support the religion of each other or the each other's and whoever يتولهم منكم فإنه من whoever among you will take them as awliya he will be among them among them and similar to it the surah al-mumtahina in verse number one but listen to what the scholar said they said about this verse specifically and let me quote what Ibn Jarir said من تولاهم ونصرهم على المؤمنين فهو من أهل دينهم وملتهم فإنه لا يتولى متول أحدا إلا هو به وبدينه وما هو عليه راض he said specifically here Ibn Jarir Tabari that this wilaya which is taken out of Islam when you love and you support their religion for instance, if a Muslim would say, I love the concept that Jesus is son of God. He's not Muslim anymore. He became Christian. That's the end of the story. If you love that, Muslims, they don't believe that. So if you love that and you support that idea, you became minhum, you became among them. And that's what we call it, al-wilayah al-ammah al-mutlaqah. Al-wilayah al-ammah al-mutlaqah. But there is another muzahara al-mushrikeen, another wilayah, another wala' al-mushrikeen, which it doesn't take you out of the fold of Islam, even though it is sin, which is you love their sins, or you love whatever. Somebody said, I love the concept that you can do anything. There is no haram, or pork, or drinking. It's allowed. I love that, and I'm, I support that. Freedom. Yeah, something like that. In Islam, this has become sin. This has became sin. This has became sin. He still knows haram to drink, still no haram to eat pork, but that's became a major sin. Or he supported them for a personal reasons. For a person, let's say a Muslim country will support a non-Muslim country because they are afraid that their economy will go down, afraid that they might attack them. So they support them by doing things which is haram in their country. Pressing the Muslims, putting them in jail, stopping da'wah. They're doing haram things because of the wala' to the kuffar. Would that became kuffar? Listen to what the scholar rahimahullah said. He said, if the wala' given because of a personal reason, a personal interest, but the belief it still exists, that will become a major sin. And the proof for that, what happened in the time of the Prophet Sallallahu when Hatib ibn Abi Balta'a fi sahihain wrote a letter to the people of Quraysh and said the Prophet is coming to attack your country and nobody knows about it. It's a treason. He re revealed that secret. He took them awliya 
He gave them wala support over the Muslims by giving the process and secrets away. The Prophet told the Zubair and Al-Maqdad and Ali go to Radat Khakh and find a woman, get me the letter to end the story. Here, listen to what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said. Ya ayyuhal ladhina amanu la tattakhidhu aduwi wa aduwakum awliya. Oh, who you believe. See, he still called Hat ibn Abi Abel Ta'ah believer. Even though Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said tulquna ilayhim bil mawadda. Even though Allah also said that he have given wala to them. Given wala to them. And the reason he did that because he said, and every one of you guys have family member in Quraysh. I don't have anybody. So I thought maybe doing them a favor. And that's why they protect my family. If there is any attack will take place, will take place. That's why the ulama have commented on this verse by saying that there is a difference between wala mutlaq, general wala, which include love and support for their deen, and the wala muqayyad li maslaha because of a personal interest. And if the wala giving because of fear, a pressure, in this case, there is no harm. You will not even be held accountable for that. As Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said in Surah Al Imran, Surah 3, verse 28, illa an tattaqu minhum tuqah. Bottom line, the love and support if it's related to the religion, to the belief that's a kufr, because of personal interest, because of love for sins that a sin, and if the love and support was given for worldly matters commonly known between humans, like all of us, regardless of our religions, we always we love and support each other when it comes to fighting cancers, to fighting poverty, to providing educations, which is the basics foundations that most of the world, modern world today build on. Love and support this. It is not a haram. It is something even the Prophet ﷺ said about Hilf al-Fudul, that if he would be invited to participate in it, he will do it again. That coalitions to fight what was wrong at that time. My brothers and sisters, it is uh, uh, sad when you uh, look also that sometimes they try to change or miscoating the scholars and the ulama just to deceive uh, others. There is a lot to be said, a lot to be discussed. I think what is the, the role of our student of knowledge and scholars to be aware that these extreme views or those people who claim that they defend Islam, and this is my final point, what's the, the best their argument? Muslims are in injustice happened to them. We stand up for the truth to support Islam. Isn't that what do you hear? The question that you ask yourself, did they support any Islam? Did they remove any injustice? Did they brought any good? The result and the outcome of their actions, you will recognize them, as Isa السلام, said. They only brought distractions. Those who killed several thousands in New York, not far away from here, what the good they have made to humanity. What good they had made to Islam and Muslims. Oh, dignity. Oh, what dignity you brought. Nothing. Nothing. The reality, the, the reality is nothing. You wipe out two countries and cause the invasion of two countries. It's planned before. You know what? Before, and I don't want to transfer this lecture to be a political lecture, claiming that America is enemy number one. America stretched their hand to help a lot of Muslims. Why this is have forgotten? In Bosnia, and in uh, uh, the issue of Afghanistan against the Russian, it is for personal interest. Taban, for personal interest, what you want? For the sake of Allah? It's so weird. You said it's, it's for the... Yes, didn't they establish the communication with the Taliban to have a pipelines for gas to use the Taliban and they were rejected by the Taliban government? Yes, they're looking for interest. They will look for somebody else like Ahmed Shah Masoud to help them. But if you're not smart enough to know how to play the game, you don't deserve to lead the Muslims' word.
If you don't know how to make the decision wisely, if you don't know how to protect your people, you don't deserve to be in the first line. If the only thing you know is just to push the button or to blow yourself up, that's not what the, what, that's not what's going to make a change in the future of Islam and Muslims. Just ask yourself, what good they have brought to the Muslims in Islam? Nothing. And put all this argument in the side. Everything they claim that they're trying to establish by what they're doing, they're only doing the opposite. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala yahdiyana wa iyaakum wa jami'a al-Muslimin li kulli khair. Allahumma inni nisaluka an turiyan al-haqqa haqqa wa turzuqna atiba'a wa turiyan al-baatila baatila wa turzuqna ishtinaabah. Allahumma salli ala Muhammadin wa ala ala Muhammad kama sallaita ala Ibrahim wa ala ala Ibrahim. Thank you very much. Whatever I said is correct, it's from Allah. Whatever is wrong, it is from myself. And really, really deeply from my heart, I encourage all of us to focus on education, to learn our deen before we rush into these issues, judging peoples and governments and individuals and war. There are so many things need, you need to deal with it in your own life, in your personal life. And I think we should put our priorities uh, straight and to focus on what will bring prosperity and good to us as Muslims, as citizen of, 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 uh, of whatever country, because it's a mixed crowd you, you're from, you should be a person who bring good to the table, not to bring disasters and animosity and, and, and problems to, to yourself and to your family and to your community. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and yaghfir lana wa alaikum wa sallallahu ala Muhammad. Thank you very much. Bismillah wa salatu wa salam wa rasulullah. In the time Danish was making the announcement, real quick, I was just asking uh, Sheikh Walid hafidhullah about what sort of questions I can ask him because we got a lot. And uh, alhamdulillah, he told me, he said, I don't like censorship and I don't like staged questions. So he said, what the people wrote, just say it. Say it in front of everybody. So um, Danish is right, the CD's for sale, but this q and is not for sale. So I would definitely stay seated because there's some interesting questions. Um, so with that, inshallah, the first question is this. Um, Sheikh Walid, Jazakallah Khair for your talk. Religious extremism in jihad and violence is definitely a real problem today. But do you think, as much as the scholars are emphasizing the jihad and violence and these problems, maybe they're forgetting to focus on other problems like irja, modernism, and other issues? Because so many times we only hear about this type of extremism now, and nobody's talking about the other issues. <coughs> uh, Bismillah. Uh, first of all, I would like to say, uh, I agree on the concept. We should not focus on one problem, forget all the other problems. There's so many problems in the, Mus in the world and uh, in the Muslim community and other communities as well. That's why out of more than maybe uh, 500 lectures I give in America, there is three of them only about terrorism. So I don't think I'm focusing on terrorism. Uh, that's one. Out of all this lecture that you're going to hear today, that's the only lecture dealing with this issue. But we just try, I agree with you, we have to be moderate. And alhamdulillah, I, have, I want to tell you that this is something we really greatly uh, take it in consideration. Yes. Another question, Sheikh. You had said in your talk that jihad is an Islamic word and a beautiful word. Could you just give a comment explaining what you meant by that? Uh, Al-Jihad in, in Islam, the word Jihad comes from Al-Juhd or Al-Jahd, which is uh, struggling when you put so much work and emphasis and uh, effort on something. Uh, Al-Jihad has uh, so many meanings. Ibn al-Qayyim rahimahullah said it has five different meanings. You can read that in Zad al-Ma'ad and it's available in English as well. Uh, Al-Jihad not only necessarily means fighting uh, with carrying weapons and fighting uh, enemies, no. Uh, Al-Jihad can be with words, uh, as Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, وَجَاهِدْهُمْ بِهِ جِهَادًا كَبِيرًا You fight the kuffar with the Qur'an, use the Qur'an as a tool of jihad, so it is an intellect uh, jihad, struggle. Also, جَاهِدُ الْمُشْرِكِينَ بِأَمْوَالِكُمْ وَأَنفُسِكُمْ وَأَيْدِيكُمْ uh, uh, 
perform jihad against the mushrikeen with your wealth, with your money, with your uh, tongue, and with your uh, hands. Uh, so the jihad is a very common word. Allah, the Prophet ﷺ also said, في الحديث الصحيح حديث أنس رضي الله عنه أرضاه that the Prophet ﷺ said the best mujahid or the best form of jihad when you stood up in front of and just ruler and you tell him the truth and you confront him with the truth then he will might execute you or kill you uh, see it's a very noble way you stand up in front of him you talk to him there's no betraying there is no deceiving uh, it's, it's very straightforward you, you stand up and you talk uh, to to him uh, that's basically uh, some examples of how the word jihad was used in other than the physical terms, the tangible way, which is carrying weapons and fighting someone. Uh, so for us, jihad, for Muslim, jihad is a system to ensure that when there is a Muslim state, that the way they declare wars, peace, basically uh, uh, equal to what known today, the defense minister, state of def uh, defense, uh, Secretary of Defense, something like that. Whatever uh, rules would govern the Muslims uh, basically in this area, that's what we call it Abwab al Jihad, the chapters of Jihad. Um, this is a this is combining a question that many people ask. Uh, Sheikh Jazakallah Khair, you touched upon some history in your lecture, and you mentioned Afghanistan in the 1970s and 80s was a great thing. Can you differentiate? that Afghanistan and today, is what is happening today also a noble jihad? Is something happening today also the good type of jihad that we should all be proud of? Um, can you please elaborate? <coughs> uh, first of all, in the 80s, the jihad was from the Muslims, uh, the Afghani Muslims groups. Even though it was not something we were happy with, pleased with, that they were more than seven groups fighting and they're not united together in the fight against the Russian. And I remember personally, not talking about somebody else, talking to some of the leaders of these groups like Abdur Bursu Sayyaf, Haqqani, uh, listening to their talk and raising these questions to them saying, if you are seven groups now, how many you will be when the war finished? If in the time of war you are seven, after war, how many groups are you going to be? And what I anticipated, and so many others at that time happened, that after the Russian were defeated and pulled out from one what was 1994 maybe, something like that? I'm, I'm not good in, uh, in, in numbers, but anyway, whenever they pulled out of Afghanistan, the war, the civil war started, the civil war started. And until today, you see there is a civil war happening in Afghanistan. The Afghanistan and the Iraq issue is not America versus Taliban. It's not America or NATO versus Taliban. It's not America versus Iraqi. That's wrong way to put it. That's not the reality. The reality is there is a group of the Afghani people with the Americans against some of the Muslims in Afghanistan. There is Iraqi people with the Americans against some of the Iraqi people. <laughs> and at least now for the time being, even forget about how it started. Now you have a government in place, you have a system in place, and it became the war. It's a civil war inside that country, inside that country. And is that a reason for a person to say that uh, the government will be kafir. Ibn Hazm, rahimahullah, even though he's a very strong uh, person in his opinion, he said, no doubt it's one of the worst, worst sins to use the kuffar in war against your own brothers so you can take over the country. But he said, I don't see any text in Quran or Sunnah or Ijma' will say that such person kafir. And he said that in Al Muhalla, rahimahullah ta'ala. Uh, so, one of the things that they always use, they just say this governor is kafir, the government is kafir, so they justify basically the war against them. Uh, in Afghanistan today, it is 
uh, it has a government, regardless of how good or bad this government, just or unjust it is. I think the Afghani people need it. And maybe it's a regret talking about the past, but I think this Al-Qaeda group, a Bin Laden group, instead of dragging the Taliban to a war against the world, they should put their effort to establish and to strengthen that young state that was coming up instead of pushing it toward the direction that it get them nowhere, it get them nowhere. But Alhamdulillah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has a wisdom behind whatever happened. But no doubt today, it is a civil war happening there, for Muslim against some Muslims. So, and in such fight, it's very clear the Muslim order to avoid such situation. Going there and to fight under which banner? Under who? For what? For what cause? What's the goal? What's the establishment that is going to happen after that? This is what I call it qital tahtarayat in ummiyah. You go to war under unknown banners. And uh, no doubt, I have no doubt in my heart that such participation and such uh, from the people and going and doing such things is not uh, a correct uh, action. Okay, um, <coughs> Bismillah. The la this is going to be the last question at this point because we have uh, other lectures as well and I've just been told um, by my brother Danish that we have uh, some guests here who are here to see the Sheikh, some um, media and, and other guests. But inshallah there will be a comprehensive question and answer session tonight and all of the Omagrib Institute instructors are very approachable for people who have questions. So with that this will be the last question for this session. Um, and, and again, this is paraphrasing multiple questions that were like this. Sheikh, you, in your lecture, you mentioned um, different organizations. What about organizations like Hamas that are more complex? They do a lot of good. They do social services. They set up schools. They help the community. But maybe they also have certain wings that are extreme or maybe certain wings that um, do have some problems as well. Do you have any comments about organizations like that? Uh, I was talking about the community, like uh, it's a trend for these uh, terrorist groups and individuals. They, they avoid to be part of the community, avoid to have part of the community. Uh, as for talking about the examples of Hezbollah and the uh, social work that they do in, in, in Lebanon, I never been there. I, I don't have really my own uh, research about them or uh, Hamas itself. So talking about them in detail, that will be another issue. But let me tell you what I know. In Hezbollah, it's a Shi'i organization. Even the support goes to Shi'i groups among them. Even that money that they give and distribute goes to the Shia. To the Shia. Even though the banner that they declare that they carry is the banner of nationalism. But if you member of Hezbollah, you have to be Shi'i, which is a contradiction which is a country, how can you to talk about nationalism and only recognize the Shia to be part of you? <laughs> Even Ahl Sunnah, their, the, their participation in fighting the occupation in southern of Lebanon, in southern of Lebanon, in Mazar al-Shab'a for example, they were Sunni people, they never been recognized by the media or by them, and their contribution never was mentioned. Uh, it is a very uh, uh, close-minded group in Hezbollah. And uh, we know the history of Hezbollah in terrorizing Muslims and Sunnis. The killing that took place by the hand of Amal, who eventually dissolved and basically became uh, part of Hezbollah in Sabra and Shatera, is something we will not be forgotten. The Palestinians that they have suffered and killed by the hand of the Shi'i militia uh, and the extreme Christian militia as well in, uh, in, in Lebanon, it's something we, alhamdulillah, we still have our memory fresh and we uh, remember it, that they have done a lot of acts of terrorism. But you might be helping and, and aiding for a political uh, reasons like giving money and food for recruiting uh, reasons for recruiting reasons. As for Hamas, they're not included in the group that I'm talking about today. Hamas, it was an elected, it was an elected uh, government in, in Gaza. Hamas has nothing to do with Al Qaeda. Hamas has nothing to do with the Bin Laden. Hamas, it is a political issues uh, putting it uh, or 
listing it in a terrorist group. What defines terrorists is not the State Department for us. What defines terrorist group is not the uh, NATO. What defines terrorist for Muslims, scholars like myself, or student of knowledge like myself, it will be the Quran and Sunnah, the Quran, the Islamically, are they terrorist group or not? Uh, we might, I might disagree with them in certain issues. And one of the issues I disagree with it completely, the suicide bombing. That's something I don't believe it is allowed, even if it's done in Tel Aviv. Even if it's done to in anywhere, I don't believe that is correct. But that's a personal opinion and I, I take. Uh, as for them, they are different completely from the, the group that I'm talking about uh, earlier. Okay, with that, inshallah, we're breaking. As I said, you can ask the Sheikh other questions in the Q&A, but not right now. There's two brothers waiting at the stairway who are going to block you from asking the Sheikh anything, and they're taking him straight to visit with the media. See, the, the, these topics bring the media out also. Uh, I just want to say that <laughs> when I talk about this, my speech, as you notice, is not directed to the media. Yani, uh, because I believe I can talk to the media, but and I, will, I don't mind to talk to them, but you more important to me than the media. Those who will hear these tapes later on were more important to the media. I'm not waiting for any recognitions or, or you know what, I stop every time I fly like you guys. You know, I came to Baltimore, I was stopped in, in, in the airport, <laughs> the last person to maybe to enter the airplane. And I don't care and I, because I say what I say because I believe it's correct. And that's when I said the nature of the Muslim community is to fight terrorism. The nature of the Muslim community to stand up for the truth, even if it is against ourselves. Walau Khan, even if he is a friend or a family member, we will stand for the truth and stop the abuser from abusing others. Wallahu alam sallallahu alayhi wa sallam.